Uh, this afternoon, I'm pleased to introduce David Weinberger. Dr. Weinberger is a senior researcher at Harvard's Berkman Center for the Internet and Society and co-director of the Harvard Library Innovation Lab at Harvard Law School. He has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Toronto and taught philosophy for six years. Dr. Weinberger has been published in varied journals, from Wired and Harvard Business Review to Scientific American and the Boston Globe, and he is a frequent commentator on NPR. He's also the author of the previous books, Small Pieces Loosely Joined, Everything is Miscellaneous, and co-author of the best-selling The Clue Train Manifesto. Today, he'll be discussing his newest book, Too Big to Know, Rethinking Knowledge Now That the Facts Aren't the Facts, Experts Are Everywhere, and the Smartest Person in the Room is the Room, A Compelling Vision of the Future of Knowledge in a Connected World, Too Big to Know was recently described by TechCrunch as a stunningly profound book. We're very pleased to bring him to Harvard Bookstore. Please join me in welcoming David Weinberger. Thank you very much for coming out on a rainy day. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I, I want to talk about some of the themes in um, Too Big to Know and, um, and to ask a, a question that I will come back to and um, completely fail to answer. Um, and the question is this. That as we all know, if you look at the major institutions of knowledge, the things that represent knowledge in our culture, and I should make clear right at the start, I'm only talking about Western culture, Western, Western knowledge. But you look at, at sort of the avatars and, and the incarnations of knowledge in our culture, it would be things like encyclopedias and newspapers and libraries. So name three things that have, are in the process of rapid collapse over the past 15 years. I mean, obviously, the, the Encyclopedia that you, my generation, the parents would put in our house as a symbol of our commitment to knowledge is now being rapidly re replaced by online sources. By Wikipedia, well, who am I kidding? You know, by Wikipedia. Uh, newspapers are being disaggregated, reaggregated. We don't know what the future of newspapers are gonna be, but that was also a sign of learning and knowledge of, of current uh, events. Libraries, um, ask any librarian. Every librarian is concerned about what the future of library is. So, and we have, these are physical buildings that l look like Greek temples that are symbols in our, in our neighborhoods of uh, our town's commitment to knowledge, and all just mm, the most stable, and mm, just, they're sort of gone. They're on their way out, one way or another. They're at least being radically transformed. And all because of this very small piece of technology, um, a hyperlink. And a hyperlink is within a much larger set of technology, but merely the fact that we could hyperlink things together, these stayed robust pillars of our culture just sort of mm, are falling apart. So the question is why, and this is, I, I think it's obviously an important question because knowledge, among other things, has made a certain promise to us that is becoming actually increasingly important to us, which is um, the late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, I think, put in a very um, powerful way that you keep seeing this quotation come up. It's um, everybody is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. And I think we like this quotation because it, it, it promises that if we all, there's all this dissension and noise and disagreement, but if we just focus, if we can just get the focus on the facts, then we can all agree. We can come to agreement and we can live in peace. And that's the promise that knowledge has made to us from its beginning, classically in ancient in ancient Greece. Uh, but from the very beginning, knowledge has had, has recognized, at least implicitly, a really important limitation, which is that the world is much, much bigger than our tiny little skulls. Our skulls do not scale to the size of the universe. And as we develop more and more knowledge over the years, our skulls get no bigger at all. So we have a huge, by the way, in case you're wondering, what's too big to know? The world is too big to know, and we have a very small piece of apparatus to do it with, and so we've had to come up with a strategy. And our strategy in the West has been incredibly efficient, um, amazingly uh, productive, and we've become the dominant species on the planet because of it, but it, it consisted of, of trying to reduce the size of what we need to know to something we could manage. Very good strategy. So we have experts who break off a brain-sized chunk of, of the world, and they know it thoroughly and deeply, and they are astounding. They're amazing. In a town like Cambridge, we all know genuine experts, and we, I assume we all find them just awesome. 
So that's one, one big piece of our strategy. And it has the advantage that we can then go to the expert or the work of the expert or the book. If we have a question, we can ask the expert, and we'll get an answer. And the key thing in this strategy is that then we can stop asking. We got the answer. We can trust that answer. If we don't trust the answer, we think maybe the expert isn't so expert. Then the expert pulls out a, a second um, uh, piece of the strategy, another stopping point, which is a credential. You say, oh, I see. You are. You've, you've gone through Oxford, and so I see you are an expert. And so I'm more likely to trust what you say. And we're right, we, of course, are right to gener generally trust experts. The efficiency in the system of knowledge that we've created is in the fact that we can ask and stop asking. It's knowledge is a series of stopping points. And as I say, an incredibly efficient and wonderful system that we've made for ourselves. But it's not how knowledge looks. That's not the shape of knowledge itself. It's the shape of knowledge when its medium is paper, when it's books and libraries. Books are disconnected. Wonderful medium. I'm talking in a bookstore. I've written a book. I'm not going to defend books. I'm going to assume we all sort of like books. So, uh, Nevertheless, just as a physical medium, they are they're limited. And so because they are disconnected from every other book, and I, I don't mean intellectually, I mean physically. They're disconnected. You, you can't click on, on the footnote and get to the next book. You've got to go to your bookstore and, and find it or go to your, your library, which generally involves getting on a bus and, and hoping the library is open and hoping it has the book and hoping the book is in, which it probably isn't. So we generally we don't chase down footnotes. Footnotes themselves are stopping points. You, you can, of course, follow them, follow them if you want to, but generally we don't. The author knows that, that he or she has very little space in the book, and so you keep the reader, you have to put everything into the book that the reader needs because it's disconnected. You can't just say, uh, I, I don't have time to explain this here, please go read there, because the person would have to get on that bus again. And so you try to get everything into the book that the reader needs. And because they're, they're small, even big books are small, compared to what there is to know, you have to keep your reader on the bus. You start the reader here. You take her through a series of steps. Um, I'm talking nonfiction here, but a series of deductive steps or good evidence. And step by step, you bring the reader along. You get consent, and you, you get her to the end of the tour. And then, But in doing so, you've had to, and every author, everybody who writes knows this, we're taught this, we're taught to focus, to wean out. There's plenty of interesting stuff to talk about, but you don't have that much room, and so you've got to keep it really a narrow focus. The long-form thinking, which has been the pinnacle of thinking in our culture, that's the way we've taken it anyway, uh, presumably on the grounds that God thinks in long-form th long thoughts and it sees. God sees how all the pieces are connected, and it's our job as, as mortals, at least traditionally, it's been to, reconstitute, to see that and to reconstitute it in our own minds. You don't have time to spread out all over. You got to go from A to Z. You don't have time to get off the, the let your reader get off the bus. So, the shape of books, the limitations of books, have, have shaped knowledge. And the primary fact is that the books are they're bound. That is, they're limited. They're sequential, and they're disconnected. And now, of course, we have a hugely connected medium for knowledge. It's all, it's all links all the time. And inevitably, just about, that changes the shape of knowledge. It's what we should expect, and it is, I think, indeed happening. So um, I want to um, talk about three different properties of the network that I think knowledge is picking up from its new medium, from the network. And the first is that the network, the internet, is incredible. It's super abundant. Right? We don't know what the final capacity of it is. If there is any final. There's, way, there's a lot of room, way more than in any known library. And so knowledge is also taking on this, this property. So uh, Clay Shirky, who many of you will know, is a uh, is brilliant internet thinker, um, said a few months ago that there, there's no uh, such thing as information overload. There's only filter failure. Uh, and He's trying to provide some historical continuity here, and I think he's right. That You look back, and we've gone through periods. Clay takes it back to the printing press. You can go back to Seneca. Anne Blair at Harvard is, has a wonderful book called Too Much to Know, um, hugely distinct from Too Big to Know, uh, which is a very serious and, and, and readable history of information overload throughout history. So yeah, we ha this happens has happened frequently in our history, and all that it really means is that uh, we, have to, we have to adjust the filters, because the world is, is, has always been too big. So we, we always have filters just to readjust them. So I, I think there's great value and truth and wisdom in this. 
the sense of historical continuity. Um, basic message is don't freak out about information overload. It happens all the time. But there are also some discontinuities, and I think it's worth pointing at them. Um, I want to point quickly at two. Um, the first is that the amount of information that we're dealing with compared to even just a few years ago is, in fact, this is not Seneca whose library had, you know, had a handful of, of books and there were too many. This is, well, so here's where the term information overload comes from. Maybe this is the way to get to the point. Um, it was popularized by Alvin Toffler in his 1970 book, really good book, um, Future Shock. Uh, he didn't invent the term, but that's how it entered the culture. It was based upon the term sensory overload, and the idea there was that you get too much, you had a Grateful Dead concert, and there's too much sound and light and music, and your sensory circuits get overloaded, and you fall down and quiver. Same thing, once we informationalized everything, we turned everything into, in, into information in our culture, which is a very weird uh, error that we've made, but that's a different topic. Once we informationalized everything, we, we said, oh, same thing's got to be true for information circuits. Too much information, you'll fall over quivering. So what did information overload look like in 1970? Well, after Toffler popularized it in 1974, some marketers did some research, some academic research, to see what, that, what information overload would be. And they took 192 housewives, if you'll pardon their expression, they, 192 housewives, and they showed them 16 different products, each of which had a label that had 16 different categories. The categories were things like uh, calories. And those categ categories are simplified down to yes, no. So. Uh, calories, low or high, 16 categories, 16 products. This was enough to diminish the mental capacity of those poor housewives. Too much, inf that was information overload. 16 categories, 16 products. The marketers therefore concluded it was in the interest of the customers, of, of the housewives, to restrict the amount of information below that. 16 categories, 16 products. This is not what we think of as information overload. This is a poor, pathetic joke about information overload. Now the amount of information that we, that we is orders and orders and orders and orders of magnitude more. So there is a discontinuity. Historically, we're talking about much less information. The second discontinuity from the tradition of information overload um, pardon me, is in the nature of filters. So when Clay Shirky says no such thing as information overload, only filter failure, yes, but as I'm pretty sure Shirky would agree, the nature of filters is, has changed in the digital age in a way that it hasn't for 2,500 years or throughout human history, actually, because physical filters filter out. You, get, you separate into the stuff you want and, and then into the dregs and you throw out the dregs. So if you are on the acquisitions committee for your local library, you accept some books, a million books are published a year, uh, in this country, you accept some books, you put them on the shelves, and people are very happy to see those to see those books. What people don't see are the rest of the million books being pulled away in dark, sad trucks. And said, oh my, you don't see the loss. All when you uh, when you filter physically, you only see what makes it through the filters. Likewise, when you read a book from a publisher, you don't see all the paper manuscripts that came to that publisher and were rejected. And furthermore, if you knew about them somehow you wouldn't be able to get to them. They're gone. They're not published. They're gone. It's not like that online. The nature of filtering has changed dramatically. So that if you now filter something, you're one of the many, many of the millions or billions of people who filter on the web. Let's say you do it by forwarding email or by participating, making, linking to things in your social networking sites or uh, tweeting or blogging or whatever. So on your blog, you decide to post the link to the best 10 posts about business this month, whatever. All that you've done is reduce the number of clicks that it takes to get to those 10. All right, so you, right on your page, one click, your readers are there. The rest of the, those books that didn't make it onto your list, they're still fully available. They may show up on somebody else's list or in a Google search or uh, you know, all the social networking sites and the rest of it. All that material is still there. It is not at all like it used to be. And not only is it there, we're constantly reminded uh, because, at least because the, um, the search engines have a good economic reason to keep telling us how many things they're not showing us. So you search for information overload at Google, you'll get over 3 million hits, and it will tell you. Three million, showing us 10, 3 million hits in 0 0.19 seconds. They're constantly telling us how much is there, and it is genuinely there, genuinely available. So online, we don't filter out, we filter forward. This, is a, this makes the abundance not only visible to us, but also accessible to us. And that is a big 
discontinuity from the old idea of information, um, information overload and filter failure. So there's too much. And so the, str the strategy that we have, have evolved with the ability to filter forward is not only to curate. We will always continue to curate because there's, every time you curate, you're doing something of value. But before you curate, we are also now building collections that basically include everything. That's a pretty good strategy. Include everything you can. Um, because you can't, whenever you curate, you're making decisions about what your users will be interested in. And you can make good, you can make better or worse decisions, but you can't make perfect decisions because you can never tell what your users are, users are going to be interested in. You can't tell because people's interests vary and are wildly, we're pretty squirrely as a species. And you can't tell because history is crazy. You can't predict that the notes from the library meetings of 1960, 1996 in Wasilla, Alaska suddenly are going to turn out to be really interesting and important in 2008. You could not possibly have predicted that. So every time you curate a collection, you are actually diminishing it, diminishing its value in some ways. So we're now including everything and we're providing tools to allow people to filter on the way out. And much of the history of the web can be read as the development of incredibly powerful tools for doing this. But I'm not they're just time, I'm not going to talk about them. You, you use them every day in any case. So second characteristic I want to talk about of knowledge that it's picking up from the nature of the net is the net is incredibly messy. There's nobody organizing it. There's no central control, which is the only reason it scaled and succeeded. Right? So it's inherently, it's a messy environment. So this is really peculiar for traditional history because in the West, traditional knowledge has meant knowing a thing's place in the order of the universe. You want to know what a bird is, you have to see how it's like other birds, other things in its category, and how, it's different, how that category differs from other categories. This is what knowledge has been for 2,500 years in the West. It's pretty Aristotelian, you know, pretty straightforward Aristotelian, but that idea has stuck. Everything has a place, everything has an essence or essential definition. Those definitions go together in a perfect order that is actually quite beautiful. Um, in a sort of Christian uh, world, this is an order that is designed by God, and it is our task as rational animals, that's our essence, that's to know us is to know that we're rational animals, or as, uh, as, as creatures made in the image of our maker, our job is to see that order where everything goes. And so we, we've spent thousands of years, literally thousands of years, arguing about whether this is one of these or one of those. What is that order? This is what we do in the real world all the time with, with objects, not with ideas, but with objects. So when a bookstore such as this one is trying to decide how to organize its shelves, it comes up with an order and says, well, we'll do it topically, and then we'll do it by author's name within each topic. Perfectly reasonable way of doing it, but if somebody else said, no, 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 we should do it purely alphabetically by author, that's how we... Somebody would have to win that argument and somebody would have to lose because there's only one way you can organize physical things. You only get one principle of, of organization. It's not like that online, though. So if you were trying to organize your, your uh, music, your digital music, you won't have that argument. What is the right way to put together your, your collection of, of MP3s? Do a playlist. Do as many playlists as you want. Do one that is by genre, one, one by the place where you first heard it, one by the mood, one by the drummer's, drummer's last name. Doesn't matter. Do them all. And each one of those adds value. It's a huge mess when you put them together. And when you put them together with the other billions of playlists that we've generated on this planet just for playlists, it's a huge, huge mess. But that's OK. Because those messes can exist simultaneously. We can have multiple ways of ordering. In fact, the very idea that there would be a single order of the universe no longer makes sense to us. It's not simply because of the net. We have a couple of generations of postmodernism driving us, and I think that's, that's right. But the idea that it, it's a useful argument to have about what the single order of the universe is, that idea just seems silly to us now. Instead, we, have, we are very happy, ha happy having multiple ways of categorizing and tagging and understanding and contextualizing objects on the web. And we see that, I think, quite, even though it, they don't go together, they're hugely messy, we see that, I think, quite properly as adding to meaning. In fact, if you wanted to scale meaning, the only way to do it is through messiness. Messes scale meaning. Third property I want to talk about is 
um, unsettling. In fact, it's the fact that knowledge is now unsettled. This is something, again, the third property that knowledge takes from the nature of the net. Um, for every fact on the net, there's an equal and opposite fact. If you go out on the net, whatever it is you think is right, you will find another opinion asserting, usually with a great deal of confidence, that no, it's something else. And I don't want to stand too literally behind this claim, although I sort of want to as well. Pretty much true. There is nothing going uncontroverted on the net. If you spend any time on the net, you are very, very likely to conclude what I think is the truth, namely, we don't agree about anything. We, we don't agree, and as more people come on, as more cultures come on, as, as more types of people, we agree about less and less. This is just the fact. I, now, I am not at all saying there are no facts. I, of course there are facts. I like facts. I like policy that are based on facts. We have some pretty good, pretty good experience now with the problem with policies that are not based on facts. So there are facts. The world is one way and not another. My point is we're not going to agree about that. And there's no, no pulling, uh, no way of laying out the facts that will now convince everybody. It won't happen. We, I believe that we should accept accept this. We are not going to come together over facts. We have rapidly, just as we've developed very rapidly ways of filtering huge masses of information far beyond the expectations of anybody who is doing information retrieval in the, in the late 80s or early 90s, it's staggering what we're now able to do. In the same way, we've, we've been developing ways to live together in a world in which we don't and can't come to agreement. And there, some of them are very simple things. They're so simple, uh, we ignore them, but they're there. Forking, for example. Forking a conversation on the net where you're in some discussion forum, doesn't matter what, what one, about, which is about some topic. So recently there was, there at uh, the YouTube of the new Batman movie trailer, you know, the conversation, which at YouTube is not usually very worthwhile, just because of the nature of the software. The way they've implemented, meant, implemented the threading at YouTube does not lead to healthy discussions. If you disagree, that's fine. I'm just saying. Nevertheless, there were about 30 posts back and forth between two people about the medical value of circumcision. It's not entirely clear what this had to do with the Batman movie. It was actually based upon some stray remark somebody made, but two guys were going at it pretty fiercely and with, seemed fairly knowledgeable, but also pretty nasty. It was like last week. You can look it up. It's just, so in a better conversational medium than YouTube provides, what would have happened, for example, if there was a mailing list about uh, you know, politics and somebody's two guys start going off about circumcision, you would have said, fork the conversation. Well, you just don't stop talking about it because you two care about it. The rest of us don't. We want to talk about something else. So go have that conversation somewhere else. You'd fork it. It's a very successful technique for dealing with, with difference, allowing it to continue without having it you know, destroy the possibility of conversation about other things. Um, another technique, so I want to mention two more. Um, I'm going to try to be really brief, but they're, um, they're really important. So um, the first is the rise of namespaces. And namespaces, you all know what namespaces are, even if you don't call them that. It's some area of life, some domain in which things get their own unique name, and those unique names may not match up, may, may not match up to how some other namespace talks about them. Um, you know, license plate numbers is a sort of medium good example. Each state has its own namespace, unique names. Um, anyway, so um, in the sciences, uh, in biology in the 19th century, we spent a long time arguing about things like how to uh, categorize the platypus, because it's a mammal that lays eggs, and thus it doesn't fit into any category. Lots and lots of professional argument about this. Um, and. It, it now seems like sort of, it seems about as silly as arguing about whether Pluto is a planet. It's just, it depends how you want to slice the world. You know, I, there isn't a right answer to that. It's just what categories you're bringing to it. So we don't have those sorts of arguments nearly as much as we used to. We still have them pretty frequently. For example, are bloggers journalists is one of those sorts of questions. Are platypuses, well, so here's what would happen at the Encyclopedia of Life, which is a wonderful site that um, is, and also the Biodiversity Heritage Library. At the EOL, the Encyclopedia of Life, every species gets its own page. Um, but they have two databases. One is of all the names they can find for every creature. So we want to call it a platypus, and I want to call it a water mole, and somebody else wants to call it by one of its two scientific Latin names. 
great. And if you go to the site, you can use whatever name you want. And I think of it as a mammal, and you think of it as, I don't know what you think of it, but you have some other t uh, taxonomy, some other classification scheme. Uh, great. When you go there, you can specify the name you want to use for these creatures and what taxonomy you want to see it in, and great, you get the information the way you want. And if two scientists who disagree about the name and the, and the taxonomy want to talk about the platypus and have an argument o over its venomous claws, because Wikipedia told me it has venomous claws, I didn't know that, then you go ahead. You don't have to worry about the argument over how to classify it because you have two different namespaces, and the namespaces are mapped. And so you can have the useful conversation, even while disagreeing about what may be a deep thing for scientists, which is how exactly you categorize and classify it. And the third way of dealing with difference, difference I want to point to really quickly, uh, is linked data, which is arising as a standard come to us from Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who gave us the web. Uh, he gave it to us without copyright or patent, which is why it works. And linked data is um, a way of taking huge clouds Clouds of data developed by, well, governments are doing this, and uh, genomics does it, and libraries are starting to do it. There's in area after area, they, um, huge clouds of data are being released. And the format in which you do it is each datum is expressed as a very simple triple, which says something like, the platypus lives in Tasmania three terms, a triple. And each of those terms is itself a link to some online reference. So if I say platypus, I will, in my data, I'll put in a link to the Encyclopedia of Life page that talks about it. And you, re you release a different cloud that says the platypus has venomous claws. And you point yours maybe at the same page. And now computers going through these clouds can say, I don't know, what a, I don't know anything about platypuses and water moles. I don't know what they are, but I do know both of these facts are referring to the same object. And so we can now start to put together automatically huge amounts of information that otherwise would have been left in, in silos. Part of what this means, however, is that the facts of old, which were nice bricks of, of, a brick of an idea, just there's a fact, they're now at the very heart, they are links. They, they are links. That's how far down this, these characteristics of the internet have penetrated into knowledge. So those are three, um, I, I'm going to wrap up. Those are three properties of, of the net that I believe knowledge is inheriting, and, and generally quite successfully. I, I hope we'll talk in the questions about some of the deep problems that this raises, living in a world in which we cannot resolve issues ever. Maybe I should point out, by the way, when talking about the lack of resolution, the fact that we always disagree, that we can't settle anything, the Moynihan quote, um, Everybody's entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. That quote that held out that promise, nobody knows if it's factual. Nobody knows if Moynihan ever said it. Nobody knows if that's the exact words. It's an unattributed quote. So uh, knowledge, uh, taking on properties of the internet of being there's too much of it, it's messy, and it's unsettled. If you think about the adjectives that I've been using in talking about these terms, like messiness and and uh, disagreement, un uncertainty, and, um, and being overwhelmed, um, never being able to come to complete and final agreement. These are properties of the internet and of knowledge, but they're also pretty good descriptions of what it means to be alive in the world. This is sort of more human language than the old language of knowledge spoke. And I think that's, insofar as I can give anything like a hint or a gesture towards the answer to the question, why did the institutions of knowledge fall over at the touch of a hyperlink? I think this has something to do with it, that in our history and in our culture, we suspected all along that what knowledge, traditional knowledge was asking of us, the certainty, the order, the perfection, the single-mindedness, the, the objectivity, the removal from, from, uh, of human touch and involvement in the objects of knowledge, the idea that knowledge uh, no matter, uh, it doesn't matter who says it, it's the same in everybody's voice, and thus stripping out the human from it that way, that there was something wrong and impossible with our old ideal of knowledge. It was not human-based. It was something else. And the properties of knowledge that, it, that it's inheriting from the internet, I think, are, in fact, far more use, human ones. That's why this type of knowledge feels so familiar to us. It's why we're, we're willing to rush to it so quickly, and it's why we are willing to abandon the old institutions of knowledge so quickly. One of the prices of this, however, is that the old dream that Moynihan expressed, among many others in our history, that knowledge will be how will bring us together, will be the thing that we that comes us that brings us to agreement, 
um, both intellectually and, and politically, that knowledge doesn't do that. It's not going to do that. That promise is not going to be fulfilled. Knowledge is not going to be the thing that brings us together. The best that we have is not a knowledge about which we all agree. It's a world that we all share, and at best share with a noisy piece. Thanks. So the question is, uh, is the singularity coming by which you, Chris Leiden, um, because there, there are different meanings of singularity, but you, you mean a sort of transformation of what it means to be human because of the presence of yeah, these machines. Specifically that you will be as much technological, a technological product as a biological product. Yeah, so, uh, in, and in particular, will you be as much a, a technological product as a biological product? Um, so I don't know what's going to happen. I, I, I don't think there is a thing that's going to happen. It's going to be whatever we do. So we're going to have to live our way through it. So I don't actually have a prediction, but I do have, um, so I'll, but I'll say something that's not a prediction, which is um, we are always uh, part biological and part technological. That seems to me pretty, pretty much a constant through what we count as human history. So humans with fire, fire was pretty transformative, and it's a technology. You know, being able to manage and control fire. Um, uh, reading and writing, hugely. We can't, we can't imagine thinking without thinking uh, uh, in, in writing's terms. We can't imagine a, a culture. We can't imagine what it would be like not to be able to read just the signs around us. There's no, there, there's no way of separating the two. So it seems not even a prediction to me to say, so this is the uninteresting question to your interesting answer to your interesting question, um, that yes, we will be a mixture of bio and tech um, inextricably because we already are. Uh, the question is how much different are we going to be um, to the extent that we should um, give a point in time and say, ah, the, or something like that, before singularity and after singularity. Um, I don't know. You never know. I mean, there's all sorts of implant stuff that uh, maybe we, and enhancements that maybe will will bring us to that point. On the current trajectory, um, I think it makes sense to talk about the internet as a as a new age worth demarking, um, just as the printing. And I think it's on the order of the printing press. And now this new age. In some ways, I think this is a bigger breach. It's actually closer to the invention of of writing and literacy. Um, nevertheless, yeah, we, we've had a singularity, and it's called the Internet. Whether we're going to head towards one where, uh, one in which um, prosthetics and genetic technology and, and integration with, further integration with the machines of connection, I don't know. Uh, that may be a question like, is it a platypus or not? I'm not, I'm not sure. How, you know, depends on what you're trying to do. So the singularity people, to some degree, are trying to get us to recognize the depth of the change by projecting out and saying we're heading towards this this one, this really big weird one, and I think it's useful to to take take seriously the depth of the change. Although I am not as convinced by the particular vision of at least some of the singularity people. Did I talk my way around that enough? Because I can do more. Yeah. <laughs> is there one piece of the singularity of transformation, including immortality, that you more or less? <laughs> All right. Uh, so the problem with immortality. <laughs> There's a, an opening, a beginning of a sentence that can't possibly end well. <laughs> no. um, the problem with the immortality argument, um, insofar as it relies upon the notion that we can download our mental states into a machine and we can keep that machine backed up. It, so there's two threads in the singularity thing that I, I understand. One is that, the other is uh, sort of auto-renewal of all our parts forever. And I'll put that to the side. Yeah. Um, but if it's um, along the lines of... Um, uh, Age of Spiritual Machines, uh, Kurzweil's book um, from about 10 years ago too, I think, uh, in which the, the question is, when will we be able to put all of our mental state into uh, a, a cheap enough computer that everybody can do it and we can live forever just by having backups, basically? Um, it seems to me, I took a passing swipe at the informationalization of everything, and this is actually a good example of why I took that swipe. Um, information is a measurement. Right? It, it, it is a measurement. It's a, uh, that's how it's defined. Um, it's an on or an off. It's a difference that makes a difference. Um, it's an on or an off. It's a one or a zero. It's a measurement. To think that a set of measurements constitutes the thing is to make a mistake, in my opinion. Um, and one of the ways of asserting this, and I can't remember who I'm borrowing this from, 
um, is to imagine, so, so you have Kurzweil's brain, his whole brain state, it's modeled in a computer, and it's following the rules that we've learned about how neurons, so when I say brain state, I mean neural state, um, how neurons interact. So we have both the, the programming and we have the initial state for the moment when Kurzweil saw his wife and fell in love, making it up. Um, Kurzweil would like to think that that is, the computer running that is in fact Kurzweil. He can outlive his body by being that program. But here's why I don't think that's the case. Um, and I, that, the program consists of a series of ons and offs in, uh, in transistors. It's actually the amount of voltage. It's above this much or it's below this much. Well, that's symbolic. To say that on is a high voltage and off is a low voltage, that's purely convention. That's a series of symbols. Um, it's a series of, it's, it's just the ones and zeros, but that is a symbol. So if you imagine a cloud of dust somewhere in the galaxy and its particles are rotating, and it's 100 billion particles, just as 100 billion neurons, and some of them are rotating this way and some that way, and we say the ones that are rotating this way, they're on, the other way is off, and oh my goodness, this particular cloud, it just simulated the 100 billion brain states perfectly for, for Kurzweil falling in love. That cloud is Kurzweil falling in love with his wife. That can't be right because we're the ones who specified this way is on and that way is off, and we could just as well do it the other way, in which case it's not. It simultaneously is and is not Kurzweil falling in love with his wife. So I don't, I don't buy, because I view information as, as symbolic, as a measurement that is symbolic of something, I can't buy that it therefore can, can actually be the thing that it's measuring. Ray Kurzweil is, is a genius. He's done magnificent things in his life. He is way, way smarter than I am, so I would believe him, not me. Well, we're, we're going to find out eventually. Um, so again, I can't, I can't predict, but I'll, I'll point to something that exists. So the question is, how does this impact education? Um, if you look at how soft, are there software developers in the room or people who work with them? So, handful. Um, then I think you'll agree, but you'll tell me with your eyes if, or, or your voice if you disagree. The software developers have created the most the best rapid learning environment in maybe the history of the species. So if you have a question about how to do something or why your code isn't working or you want to learn a new, new language, you can go on the web, you can use a search engine, you can go to any of a number of sites, you will get answers that are complete, that are community driven, that are often um, iterated on until they get better and better. Uh, you'll find the complete code that you were trying to write, there it is, somebody posted it for free because this is a wildly collaborative environment. It's a highly tuned environment because it's done by developers who know how to you know, build the stuff that, that they want. I hope that we all end up with environments that are as good as that. And one of the good things about it is that it views education as a public process, not as the private informing of an individual. So it's not that I'm the teacher, you're the student, I'm going to make you better, I'm going to instruct you, and because you're a better person, you'll go out and make a better world. I mean, that's really good thing, but it's not just that. It's that the it's notion that if I instruct you, if you are learning from me, then that process, that learning itself ought to be made public. When I ask a question at, at a software site, I don't know how to do something, that answer is there permanently. It's written often in such a way that others coming in will be able to, to learn from it. The notion that education is not a private act, but a public act, I, th I think is, a, it, is an important idea that's percolating through the system, not always through the educational system yet, but through, through, through the net and through the generation that's growing up on the net. That it's selfish for education to be just of me. So educating, I, I hope that educating in public will become a norm. Um, so let me, by way of rephrase, uh, repeating your question, rephrase it and see if I get it right. I mean, one of the ways of rephrasing that is, um, how do we come to trust, how can we come to trust facts enough in order to make good decisions? When there are no longer any facts. Well, there are facts. There are lots of, uh, let me, so the subtitle, of, part of the subtitle of my book is not uh, now that the facts are, now that facts are not facts. It's now that the facts are not the facts. And I admit it's a subtle difference, but it's, I, I want to insist on it. Because there are facts. There are things that are right, and there are things that are wrong and will die if we don't get that right. 
So there are facts. What I'm saying is we're not going to agree about the facts. We have incumbent upon us the same responsibility we've always had, which is to do our level best to try to discern the way the world is and act appropriately. The, it used to be that we, there were fewer, it was harder for pretenders to get the megaphone, to get the microphone. Now it's insanely easy for anybody to get the microphone. And so it's easier to go wrong because somebody will sound like she or he is knowledgeable and they have the right knowledgeable font on the page and it just you know, sounds really right and it's, it's all wrong and it can be deadly wrong advice depending on the area. That, that is a problem. That is why I threw in what should have been the first part of the answer to you, which is when it comes to education, internet literacy, which means uh, critical thinking, um, but tuned to the new set of problems, uh, is, is vital and imperfect. But it's vital. We, schools and we all need to be doing, doing it better. It's not going to result, however, in a world in which people believe the right facts. Believe the, people are going to, we're not going to be able to, and I'm just, I'm, I'm not happy about this. I'm just saying that it looks empirically like it doesn't matter how many facts you bring forward, people who don't want to believe them or have some other set of facts, they're not going to change their mind. We're not going to resolve the question of where Obama was born on the facts because we did resolve that on the facts a long time ago, but it doesn't seem to matter. I'm sorry, I'm in Cambridge, I'm a Democrat, so I'm taking that example. You can do your own. It, it, we're, it, the, fact, the facts are not the facts. We no longer have um, such a, a narrow uh, orifice through which information is communicated that it can be managed and controlled by responsible experts. I should also point out, though, that in the age of responsible experts who are forcing things through a very small aperture, you lost a lot there. That system, first of all, there were errors. There were systemic, well-known systemic problems with, say, what was getting published because it was dominated by uh, white men. You know, I mean, it was very limited in what got through that aperture. And furthermore, even if everything that got through was, was really only the most important unbiased stuff, there's a world of, of information and science and, and thought that was just way too big for that model, which we see now, we see right before us. I'll give you a very quick example, although I seem unable to give quick examples. I'm going to anyway. So this is, this is from Michael Nielsen, who has a book um, which you should get, uh, uh, Reinventing Discovery, and he, he came through the center I'm at and he um, gives this example. You know the faster than light neutrino controversy? You know, findings that, in fact, these particles may be moving faster than light, which would throw out much of relativity theory. It's a really big issue. So this, these findings were posted at archive.org, A-R-X-I-V.org, which is a site that scientists can go to to post whatever they want. No peer review. Just post it. Preliminary results. Post it. It was posted there. Huge flurry of interest uh, and controversy. And article after article were posted there. Uh, again, without peer review, it spread out across the web, mainstream media. Mainstream media, you'd get some good articles, but if you didn't understand the article, you had nowhere to go within the print media. And so you'd go out on the web and you'd find people explaining it at every level of education. To people who are advanced, people who don't have the math, like me, you'd still get good explanations. Hypothes hypotheses thrown up and counters and all. All of this happened on the web over the course of a few months. It would have taken years to go through the peer review print process. It would not, and it would have been a tiny slice of the information that was developed. That old system does not scale. It has many advantages, including um, restricting wildly crazy and dangerous ideas from public attention. The notion that uh, vaccines cause autism, and I'm sorry if I'm about to offend anybody, a crap idea that's going to kill kids or really damage kill kids, that idea would not made it, have made it into the mainstream. If you want to argue with me about it, we can do it afterwards. It's not the point. <laughs> so there are terrible prices that we pay for having opened this up. But on the other hand, that old system was repressive in both senses, and it did not scale, and now it does. The new system does, for better and for worse. And a lot of it's for the better. Very yeah, so how is the world different when everything is in the cloud and you don't have control over it and your life can be wiped out in an instant? Um, and, and that's. Well, it's not your life, it's just the digital information. Well, for right. a lot of us, it's pretty much our life. Yeah. Some of us are pretty sad, right. lonely creatures, and yeah, that would pretty much be my life. 
Um, and so we are, I think we are, um, we are making assumptions because we haven't had the big wipeout of, of personal data that will scare us. It would be a big wipeout. It would be just a wipeout of some people. You know? Well, but that's a, so th that has happened, of course. I mean, there's a, sure, I mean, there are people who um, uh, have lost, so this is a small example, but uh, people have lost all their YouTubes. And a big part of their social life has been around these YouTubes, or their Facebook account was deleted and they can't get it back. Or that's a, a disaster for them socially because that's where they're leading much of their social life, which I, I don't think, frankly, is unhealthy. I and mean, it's, it's we're very social creatures; we'll fill every interest. This, so it, it does happen to individuals. What we haven't had is the massive outage in which an entire population loses some important segment of its data. At which point. Uh, the fact we will lose some trust in the mega or corporations, bad that, that or a bad actor. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna, yep. I'm gonna get rid of this country. Uh, for example. Yeah. Um, so the people, it, it may not happen. We'll see how good the IT you know um, practices are of of, and since this is their lives, the the, the large providers, are, you know, they're pretty interested in, in doing well. But you could also so two things. First is that. Um, the benefit, one of the benefits we get is ubiquity, that we can have this stuff wherever we go, and it's becoming increasingly important and will only become more important. And that, that's actually a big deal. The, the time when you could count on everybody having a, self, uh, having a, a, a telephone, and so that you as a business could say, well, you need support, just call me, and not have to say, well, if you have a telephone and if you don't, then here's an alternative. That was, a, that was an important shift, and we're heading towards a time when we can say not only everybody just about. So it's only like 95% of Americans actually have phones, including cell phones, but 95% is enough for us to claim ubiquity. And at some point, we'll have that. We'll get over enough of the digital divide that we'll, we will have that. And furthermore, you'll be able to have it pretty much wherever you go. We're getting very, pretty close for many of us who live, you know, live with our, yeah, fine, a lot of dead zones. And, um, that will change things. Too and living in the cloud will therefore mean that your life travels with you, and we'll find we'll like that a lot. We already do. Um, the second thing I'd point to is how many of you use Dropbox? That's about half of you. Dropbox is insanely popular, and in part um, because it it allows you to put something in the cloud, your, your whatever documents or whatever you're working on on your personal computer just automatically goes up in the cloud, you go onto some other cute computer and there they are. But part of, I think part of the reason that Dropbox has succeeded is not only because it's free and because it's, it, it works really easily, is, is that it keeps local copies. It keeps a copy on your computer as well. So if you're not in the cloud or if the cloud goes down, you've still got a copy with you. And that may be, I don't know how widespread that's gonna be, but um, Dropbox it became an instant hit in a space where there are many other contenders because it got a lot of things right, and I think that's one of the things that got right. But we'll see. Back up your computers, people. <laughs> Just a reminder. So what most excites me and concerns me about knowledge in this age? Uh, so most exciting, maybe, is the rise of knowledge networks, which is actually the main theme in the book. I forgot to mention. <laughs> this book is too big to talk about. <laughs> Um, the fact that we can go to, if you have, first of all, you can look up a whole bunch of stuff. We've commoditized, made uh, widely available for free a whole range of facts. It used to be in almanacs, now it's on Google, but it's up a layer, and it's up another layer because we have Wikipedia, we can get encyclopedia type stuff. We can be having an argument and, and say, well, let me, oh yeah, well, Wikipedia says, and we have another, we've raised the level of uh, available commoditized information. That's very exciting. But more important than that is the fact that you can go to, um, if you have a question that is, isn't the sort that gets answered by Wikipedia or the Internet Movie Database, you can go find a set of people who will um, be a, a network, permanent or temporary, discussing something that uh, includes difference and disagreement amongst them, and they will come out with a better discussion and understanding than any of the individuals can. So how many of us are on mailing lists that matter to them? I want to know sort of how old I am. Uh, pretty good. So that's, again, about half. And mailing lists, which are an older technology, are very important to me and my cohort. Um, I'm on mailing lists that have been going on for years, and it's sets of people who know a lot more about topics I barely know about, like FCC policy. And that's a huge source of news for me, because they're the ones that are surfacing stuff that will never make it into the mainstream, because the mainstream you know, not, doesn't care that much about it. And they'll go at back and forth arguing about what this means. and. That is an unbelievably rich source of knowledge. 
And it's only because these people disagree with one another to some extent that the mailing list is more knowledgeable than any of the individuals. The availability, that takes knowledge up a level, and it, I think it's tremendously exciting, although it means that knowledge becomes less stable because the benefit of these networks only, ex only exists if the people in them disagree one way or another. The, I'd say the main thing that I worry about is, um, so here we are on the net, there's all this difference and disagreement, which is lovely and important because that's where knowledge and wisdom comes from. But there is some pretty good evidence that the net is very diverse, but our experience of it is hemmed in by our own. We like to hang out with people who are like us in every regard, but let's just talk about in beliefs. We like, and when you do that, there's also evidence that your own beliefs harden. So you don't get more open on the internet, you harden, and you become more extreme. This is the echo chamber argument. This is Cass Sunstein, Republic.com, um, Harvard Law professor who's currently in the Obama White House. Uh, he puts it forward most strongly. And I spend, uh, I, I spend a good deal of time in, is it okay for me to refer to my book? I feel like I'm plugging it. <laughs> I, I guess I am. So I spend a good deal of time in the book on the echo chamber argument, which actually worries, it worries me, and we have to be working against it at every level, personally, individually, with our children, but I actually am not quite as worried as other people are. Um, I think we are encountering more diversity than ever before. Right? This is a comparative thing. It's how it was and how it is. I think we're encountering more diversity of opinion than ever before. We are more aware of the diversity of opinion than ever before than when we were getting these newspapers rolled up, thrown onto our porch, that gave us this much diversity. You know, there still is no socialist newspaper column, columnist. You cannot be that much to the left and make it into a newspaper. Newspapers, we all love them, God bless them. They're a very narrow slice of, of life. And now we are at least aware that they're, we may call, call the other opinions crazy, but at least we're aware that they're, that they're there. And finally, um, I'll just sort of tip my hat to this because it's too big a topic, but the, behind the echo chamber argument, I think, is a, an enlightenment faith that um, the only real and good conversations to have are among two people who disagree fundamentally and agree to be open to one another and to work their way down to fundamental principles and facts. And one may be, so the, our, the stereotypical one, wrong word, paradigmatic one would be a Jew who is talking with a neo-Nazi and says, my friend, we have many differences, but let us reason together. We can, maybe we'll find some common ground, we'll come to agreement. I, and be, for this to be a real conversation, I am as open to change and becoming a neo-Nazi as you, my friend, are open to becoming a Jew. <laughs> Not only doesn't that conversation happen, it can't happen because conversation requires so much agreement to go forward. You have to agree on language and topics of interest and norms of conversation. You have to agree on so much in order to have a productive conversation that the critique of the net that says it does, it's not enough, people who disagree wildly are not encountering each other enough, I think is, has a romanticized and misleading idea about how we talk with one another, what the conditions for conversation are. So in that regard, I'm not as exercised about it, but I do fully believe that we have to do everything we can to try to open ourselves up and open our children up. So sort of a <laughs> I'm sort of rejecting some of the fear and premises of the argument, but recognizing that it's, it is an important thing to counter. Time for one more on the internet. Um, how concerned am I about the protection of intellectual property at the expense of, fr of free speech and free thought? Um, and I'll give you just a... Um, I'm, I'm personally very predictable on this topic. I mentioned I'm a sort of Boston, Cambridge, Democrat, liberal, Jew guy, so you can pretty much predict where I stand on this. Um, for me, intellectual property is a term that should never be used. It's already conceding the metaphor. Ideas are not property. They are the opposite of property. They only have value insofar as they are given away as opposed to when they are held. There are, I, I personally would move for radical co copyright reform, not throwing it out. Uh, but rethinking it entirely, shortening the term, um, uh, expanding fair use so that I, as an author, if you're an author, you get these letters too. I, I will get letters from, from, from earnest other authors saying, uh, dear sir, I would very much like to quote 
three words from your book. Could you please sign this permission slip? That's where we are. That is literally where we are in this culture. It is a disaster. Culture is the thing that we have between us that we share. And since nothing has gone into the public domain uh, since 1923 by timing out a copyright, and since the term of copyright is now 70 years after the author's death, and this is for a system that is intended to provide incentives for authors and creators to create things, and as James Boyle says, he's also a wonderful writer whose books are here. Um, you don't, so far, the attempt to incentivize dead authors to write more has not succeeded. Um, the copyright situation, which is getting worse and worse and is in crisis, both sides escalating and coming to, uh, it's, um, we, we can either go down a path that gives us a new dark ages where we have increased control over um, over people's create creations. It is now entirely possible for a, somebody, for an ebook to charge you for the second time you read it. You know, why not? You're getting second, twice as much value from it. You pirates for rereading? There's no, I, I promise you this, this will happen. Um, so we can either have a dark ages where we have an insane amounts of detail control over the consumption of cultural objects, or we can have a new renaissance in which we don't consume cultural objects, we share them. Um, and you can tell where I stand on this. So uh, it's a very inadequate answer, but it's a huge question, and we're at the end. So, uh, it's thank a, you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, thank you very much for the wonderful questions. Yeah.